Well, it's been a while. Perhaps you need a little boost. Well, you'll get one in this episode of HTM School. This episode is about homeostasis. The idea is that life forms maintain some kind of physiological constancy or stability in spite of uh, external conditions. This type of phenomenon is also observed in your brain and your neocortex. Think about it. You could get uh, tons of different input from your senses. Some could be very dense, some could be very light. The brain has mechanisms to keep homeostasis in cortical networks. Let's see here. Homeostatic regulation of neuronal excitability refers to the collective phenomena by which neurons alter their intrinsic or synaptic properties to maintain a target level of electronical activity. In HTM theory, we call this boosting. In order for a column in the spatial pooler to express itself, it must be selected as a winning column. You remember from our last episode when I talked about the topmost columns with the highest overlap with the input space being selected as winning columns. So the columns with high overlap with the current input are more likely to be selected as winning columns. Loser columns are inhibited from expressing themselves. Only winner columns can update their permanences with the input space. This process of preventing loser columns from learning is called inhibition. The boosting mechanism I'm about to describe can change a column's overlap score before this inhibition phase even occurs, giving less active columns a better chance to express themselves and inhibiting columns that seem to be overactive. So let's take a look first at active duty cycles of spatial pooler columns. Uh, this visualization is going to show us how active columns are over time. And you're going to see as I hit this button that a very small minority of the available columns are going to be actively trying uh, to interpret the spatial information in this input space over time. Um, in fact, you can see these red ones are the ones that uh, have the most activity. Active duty cycle is essentially just how many times has the column been active over a certain period of time? Um, in this case, these red ones have been active every time step because the active duty cycle maximum is one. That's 100% of the time. So all of these very red dots have never turned off. They've been active the entire time so far. Um, some of these, uh, the, the orangish ones, the yellowish ones, they're somewhere in between. Uh, as we now finally some of those turned off, so the maximum active duty cycle is now uh, in the 90 percentile range. Um, and uh, all of the ones that are zero have never been active. And in many cases, they never will be active. So let's, let's talk about this very explicitly. Um, as you can see, I, I made this little visualization of uh, connections over here. So let's take this, this guy right here. If we look at him, his overlap with the input space is 19. And as you know, that means 19 input bits are uh, overlapping with its connections that it currently has with the input space. Um, and we're not boosting it at all. And so we'll talk about boosting in just a minute. So uh, if we were to turn boosting on, which I'm gonna do right now, um, I'm just gonna make it two. This is uh, sort of the maximum boost uh, is, a, is a field that we use. Um, to uh, specify how aggressive our boosting algorithm is gonna be to try and do this homeostatic normalization sort of deal. Um, so <clears throat> as I start playing here, I'm gonna show these boost factors on the right. Now the boost factors are associated with each column. So it's a one-to-one, -one, um, each column has a boost factor and it's just a multiplier for the overlap score for that column. So before we move to the inhibition phase, and inhibition, if you remember from previous episodes when we stacked up all the winner columns, you know, and we'll take many of the first 40 winners with the highest overlap score, those are the winners. Um, and the rest don't learn anything, right? Only the winners learn, that's inhibition. We inhibit all of the loser columns from learning. So if we were to change the overlap scores of the columns before we did that inhibition phase, we can affect which columns end up learning and which ones end up expressing themselves and which ones don't. That's what boosting does. Uh, in this case, 
um, all of the very weak columns, for example, all of the ones that are um, green over here, uh, have very little overlap with the input space, but we're going to artificially boost them up so that they can start expressing themselves uh, with what they see are the patterns in the input space. So in, in this case here, where I'm, I'm looking at this cell right here, its overlap score is 17. There's 17 input bits that are overlapping with its connections to the input space. But the boosted overlap score is 17.68 because of its boost factor. So that column has a particular boost factor. I don't know exactly what it is. It's somewhere in between 0.74 and 1.04. So it's probably 1.04. Um, each one of these green ones is being boosted a little bit to try and encourage it to express itself. Um, now, if we look at the, the red ones, uh, this one has an overlap of 33, but the boosted overlap is only 25.92 because we're trying to uh, diminish that column from being active the next time because it's expressing itself too much. So, so this whole idea of boosting uh, is is just applying a multiplier on the overlap score for each column to encourage it to either be more active or be less active. Um, and these numbers for the boost factors and how they are calculated for each column, that's part of the um, boosting algorithm. I'm not going to talk explicitly about that, but it it's basically looks at the active duty cycles for a, for a cell and all of its surrounding cells and, and just to get an idea, is that one way too high, way too low? Uh, how should we affect it? It's you know maybe 10 or 20 lines of code uh, that does this little calculation to get us these boost factors. So that is what's providing this homeostasis that we're talking about. We want all these columns to, uh, to represent themselves, to express themselves about what they see in the input. And this boosting mechanism um, prevents some of the strongest columns that come out uh, from the spatial representation, from dominating the representation entirely. It kind of squelches those down and encourages the weaker columns to uh, take part and say what you think about the patterns that are going on. So it gives them a chance to express themselves. So I also want to show what this looks like when you compare a spatial pooler that has boosting on versus has boosting off. So in this comparison, I've got one with boosting off entirely, and the right hand or the, the bottom graph and, and the right hand uh, grid has boosting at 10. So I'm gonna run this ahead for a bit and then we're gonna talk about what we see here. But you can already tell immediately that with boosting on, the spatial pooler is much more efficient because it's using more of its columns to represent the data, to, to model this data. With boosting off, there's just a small minority of columns that are even contributing to the model at all. So when we have boosting on, we can spread that around and take advantage of all of those columns that could potentially be contributing to the model. So let me step in and uh, talk about some of what's going on here in this representation. So one of the things you you might have noticed is that uh, the weekend representation is certainly easy to discern from both of these patterns, um, but uh, there seems to be a higher granularity in the spatial recognition happening with boosting on. For example, at this point in the day, um, this is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so it's a weekday, we have not only similarity with um, other days at that general power level, but we have a specific time-based similarity as well. So for example, with boosting off, this point is very similar to all the different power levels that we've seen on a weekday, um, no matter what time of the day that it occurred. With boosting on, we have a much higher similarity with not only that power level we've seen in the past, but at that time that we've seen in the past. So at each point in the day, you can, you can sort of identify there was a, a time where it was most similar, whereas in the previous, uh, the one without boosting on, it's harder to discern at what point in that day is the most similar point. So uh, there's, there's that to think about. And you can also tell as we bounce along here, and we're going to move, we're moving into a Friday now. Uh, you can tell as we move into, uh, from a Friday into a weekend, 
there's a big difference in how weekends are interpreted, whether we have boosting on or boosting off. Uh, so boom, we just moved into a weekend. And immediately, both of these are recognizing that this is a weekend. This has um, semantic similarity with this entire swath of data, which was a weekend. But with boosting on, again, we're going to have higher similarity with that time of day than, than we are with the entire weekend, which in, in the case of boosting off, it's ma mostly making the association with, oh, I'm in a weekend, so I'm more similar to the times I've been in a weekend. With boosting on, since we've got that more spatial granularity, we've got more of those weaker columns, having the ability to represent not only a weekend that we're like the stronger columns are doing, but time of day or um, uh, power level, we, we have this stronger association with not only the weekends, but the time of day of the weekend and the power level. And as we move across into uh, the next weekend day, you can see that, you know, you can see these, uh, these green balls moving along with the red bar over here uh, as we move along. So it's, it's a, a higher granularity of spatial recognition that you can get with boosting. And this is a range effect. You can go from one to as high as you want for max boost. So if you want to uh, distribute the activity completely, you can, and you can still get some semantic information out of it. And every column will have the exact, almost the exact same active duty cycle if you make boosting uh, max boost something like 100. Um, so you'll see that when you do that, it'll really spread the activity out throughout all of the columns. None of them will be very much higher in active duty cycles than the others. We need boosting to distribute the cellular activity throughout the spatial pooler to take advantage of each of the columns potential to contribute to the model that we're creating. The, um, Boosting squelches these overactive columns and encourages the less active columns to become more active more often. And that's basically the, the gist of it. It's not too complicated, um, but it's a very important mechanism in HTM theory. Otherwise, we don't get the efficiency that we need to get out of spatial pooling. So thank you again for watching HTM School episode nine on boosting. If you like this series, please subscribe to our YouTube channel please give us a thumbs up. I greatly appreciate it. Mexico. Breakfast of champions. <clears throat> so the columns with that high overlap, they, um, so I'm just going to run this spatial pooler. And what I've got here, oh shit. One means it's been active 100% of the time, and zero means that it has not been active at all. Hello? I'm good, thanks for calling back. Yeah, I, I want that guitar. I'm, I'm gonna come get it later today. Awesome, thank you. All right, see you then, bye. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> where was I? One of the things you might have noticed is, oh, what? That's weird. I used to be able to do this. Oh, there we go. This is a redo of duty cycle. Is it a redo of duty cycle? So let's take a look at columns in the spatial pooler.